All right, good morning, Story family. How are we doing today? Good, good. I'm glad y'all are here. It's uh, the first week of spring slash summer uh, in the end of February in Houston, Texas. So we hit like 95 degrees yesterday, I think. And there's a lot to be excited about, a lot to be grateful for. It's the first week of rodeo season, which is like Christmas in my house. The Huffman family loves the rodeo. I married an Ecuadorian woman, and naturally, she loves the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo and can't get enough of it. So uh, we're trying to get there as often as we can over the next few weeks. Your tickets to the rodeo donated to your pastors is a tax-deductible donation, <laughs> I think. Ask your accountant. Just kidding. All right, kind of. All right, so we are, we are we're celebrating the rodeo in Houston. We've also got uh, March Madness that is uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. Houston Cougars, number one team in the land, all right? And uh, Astros opening day just about a month away. So lots going on, lots to be excited about. And if you just applauded or whooped for one of those things, then you're now obligated to do the same at the end of the sermon. Otherwise, that's idolatry. I'm sorry to say, it's, uh, I tested you and you failed the test. I'm just kidding. So uh, my name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here at The Story. And if you're joining us here in person in the Museum District, the beautiful Museum District of Houston, Texas, or if you're joining us over at our Timber Grove campus in the Heights and you're tuning into this message right now, hello to all of you. We love you. I'm so glad that you're here at 8200 Washington Avenue in Timber Grove. Also, if you're joining us online, you're part of the Story family today, and uh, we really are grateful that you're making the time to be a part of this community, however you're doing that. Um, so we are in the thick of the longest message series that we've ever uh, done at The Story by far. Before this one, the longest was, I think, nine weeks long. This one is 22 weeks long, and we are in uh, the home stretch now. We're on port part 14 of 22 today, uh, and this series is called A Physician and the Facts. It's because uh, Luke... The gospel writer of the Gospel of Luke was a physician by trade. He was a, a medical doctor and also a, a Gentile, the only non-Jew that wrote any part of the Bible. And, and we have his writings preserved for thousands of years now for us to study and excavate together. So we're following the whole book of Luke. Um, we're reading the whole thing in our daily reading guides, which you can find on our website, thestory.church slash resources. Also, um, we're preaching through most of the book as well. What I love about preaching through the book and also what I hate about preaching <laughs> through a book like this is that you don't get to pick and choose as much. Preachers often like to preach the same topics for their whole careers even. There are preachers that love to talk about the love of God. There are preachers that love to talk about, you know, like my shtick kind of is like science and faith, right? Or like skeptics and faith, like stuff like that sparks the intellect. That's what I love to talk about the most. And, and every preacher kind of has his or her thing, right? Um, well, this series is getting me out of that comfort zone a little bit. And today is a good example of that. There are sermons you really want to preach, and then there are sermons you have to preach and this is the latter, and I'm just warning you that you're going to really be challenged by this. I hope you are challenged by this, because I was challenged in the preparation part of this um, message, because we're getting it straight from Jesus himself today, and it's not going to be comfortable at all. The question that today's passage sort of uh, revolves around is a question that's going to seem familiar. It's sort of this question of why do bad things happen to good people? How many of you have heard someone ask this question? Why do bad things happen to good people? How, how many of you have asked this question, right? Why do bad things happen to good people when tragedy strikes and there's mass casualties or someone just continues to get one bad diagnosis after another? Why, God, where are you when bad things happen to good people? What's going on? How do we make sense of this? That's kind of where we're going today, and we might be surprised by Jesus' response to this question today in a number of ways. I think he's going to catch us off guard. So you have study guides. You have Bibles, I hope, um, in the chair backs in front of you. At least there's a Bible. You can follow along in your study guides with me as we dig into today's um, passage from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. All right, so this is uh, chapter 13. 
of the Gospel of Luke, verse 1. And I just want you to know, contextually, right before this, Jesus had been talking and teaching about some heavy topics, um, not least of which were things like hell and fear and anxiety in the end times. But right before he paused here, um, he had been talking about how to deal with your accuser or someone you've got beef with, what to do with them. And then this happens, okay? Chapter 13, verse 1. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans. So Galileans, people from Galilee, Jesus' kinsmen. Galileans whose blood that Pontius Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. They're telling Jesus a report of a historical event. Pontius Pilate, the governor sort of of the Judean province of the Roman Empire, had ordered a mass casualty event in which Galilean civilians were murdered while they worshiped. How do we know? Because their blood mixed with their sacrifices. The only place that Jewish people in the first century offered animal sacrifices were at the temple. They were worshiping as part of a festival, probably Passover. And Pilate, for whatever reason, ordered a mass casualty event. Okay, so that's what they're reporting to him. Pilate had mixed their blood with their sacrifices. So they're giving Jesus this news, traumatized, right? And then Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Like that's a weird (laughs) response to their report. Just think about it like you're there, right? Think about what it would be like to have Jesus answer this way. Do you think they were any worse because this happened to them, basically? And then Jesus says, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or, he goes on, those 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. All right, all right. How are we feeling? A little light reading on a Sunday morning, nothing like it, all right? I'm telling you, I don't want to say what I'm about to have to tell you, but it's just a duty that I have to tell you straight from Jesus himself what exactly this means for us and the danger we're in if we don't heed the warning of Jesus here. Okay, so these people that came to him and reported this bloodshed, they're reporting a scandal. This was a traumatic event that we assume had just taken place recently because they report it like it's news. Have you heard, they say, in a, in a manner of speaking. And so they're sort of, they're, they're, they're sort of um, dealing, they're processing this news themselves. And it's like they want to know what many of us want to know. Where was God? When these righteous, good, upstanding Galileans went to the temple with God on their minds and in their hearts to offer their sacrifices to the one true God of Israel, and they were slaughtered in God's own house, where was God? That's what they're asking. You got to read between the lines to see it, but it's no wonder that they asked that. We would ask the same thing. We've seen bloodshed in houses of worship in our own country in recent years. And we are prone to ask the same questions. Where was God? All right? So that's kind of the heart that they're, that they're bringing to this. And just so you know, like, there's no other historical record of this event happening outside of scripture, but there's no doubt things like this did happen, and there's no reason to believe this wasn't an actual historical event they're reporting, because Pontius Pilate is a bad guy, to say the least, just a bad, bloodthirsty tyrant who did things like this with regularity, according to the historical record, not just the biblical historical record, but even secular historical sources extra biblical sources, point to Pilate doing very similar things as this. For example, we have multiple records of a decision Pilate made to squelch an uprising 
in Judea, in Jerusalem, just in the years prior to Jesus' ministry. And Josephus and other historians tell us about the time that Pilate wanted to build an aqueduct, like part of the infrastructure. He wanted to introduce more Roman style plumbing into the city of Jerusalem. And he took money from the temple treasury to do it. And this upset the, the Jewish folks because that's not what that money's for. We gave that money to God, not to Rome. And so give it back. And they staged a protest and they went to, to demand their money be returned to the temple. And in the midst of their protest, Pontius Pilate did what overreaching governments have done ever since the dawn of time. He put some of his soldiers in plain clothes and he planted them within the revolt or within the protest and he gave them a signal and when they got that signal, they were to, they were to elicit a response from the crowd. They were to lead the sort of uprising and uh, to uh, further incite the violence and then they were to punish those around them who were following through on the violence. That's what he did. Pilate uh, had plainclothes soldiers within the Jewish protest, and at his command, not only did they incite the uprising, but they, at some point in the mayhem, pulled daggers out of their, out of their belts and began stabbing both those doing violence and those who weren't part of the violence as part of Pilate's uh, justice being levied on these peasants demanding their tithes and offerings be returned to the temple. That's just who this guy was. So we often wait to talk about Pontius Pilate till Holy Week, right? That we always talk about his little conversation with Jesus, what is truth? And, and then sometimes Pilate, we talk about him overseeing the sentencing of Jesus when the mob wanted him crucified and Pilate's like, what do he do? I don't get it. And he washes his hands. We almost treat Pilate like some kind of a domesticated buffoon, like he's kind of a nice guy, but just in a tough spot. No, nah, no, nah, don't be fooled. Pilate, a bad hombre, all right? He was one of them that uh, used his power and wielded it with an iron fist to enforce peace, um, Roman style, okay? So that's the reality that these people uh, were living in, okay? So um, Jesus' response to their trauma and the questions implied is, in some ways, incomprehensible. You would expect a good pastor to hear the cries of people's hearts. Did you hear about this awful thing that happened to our kinsmen? And say something like, that's awful, I'm so sorry. Maybe let's have a service in their memory or uh, thoughts and prayers or something that pastors say. Instead, how did Jesus respond to their report? It's found in verses uh, two and three of chapter 13. Do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners? than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. What kind of answer is that? These people are hurting and confused. They're wondering where God was in the midst of these bad things happening to these people, good or bad, who knows? But Jesus' response is, you ever go to the Bible, you ever go to to the word of God with one question and then the Bible just throws a whole different question back at you? Like, that's how God is sometimes. God can so see within us and the deeper levels of, of our questioning that sometimes he can cut right to the chase. Because at the heart of this question is uh, that, that, the, that the people came asking was a deeper question. Instead of saying, where was God? Or uh, why do bad things happen to God, to good people? Or why them? Jesus wants us to ask different questions. What question does Jesus tell us we should ask? Let's keep, let's keep pressing into this to figure out what questions we should ask instead of why do bad things happen to good people, all right? Now, to follow up on this point Jesus made, he tells them about another event. He reminds them, they knew about it apparently, of, of another tragedy. What was the other tragedy? A tower fell on some people. Awful, right? A limestone, presumably tower, fell off the wall at the pool of Siloam in Jerusalem and crushed 18 people. We don't know who they were. Construction workers, uh, just 
passers-by, who knows? We don't know what happened, but this tower fell. And Jesus brings this up, and, he, and then he says the same thing, right? What does, he, what does he say about these people, those 18 who died in Siloam? He says in verses 4 and 5, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. Friends, anytime you read the Bible, Bible study tool 101 here, if it's repeated, it must be important. And this is the second time he said this verbatim. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now, why bring this story up? Because it illustrates something specific. When you lay the second story on top of the first one, you're left with only one common denominator. Because other than this one thing, they had nothing in common. One was an atrocity ordered willfully by a bloodthirsty tyrant. The other was an accident. The kinds of things that happen every day on construction sites or just around poorly constructed towers and things, right? This stuff happens. Ironically enough, insurance companies call them acts of God. That's right. And God's like, you guys, I don't know. But he gets blamed for a lot of things even by secular insurance companies, even to this day, right? So what is it that these two events have in common? Not much, other than they, uh, both of these types of events uh, arouse in us the same kinds of questions about God and what's fair and who's good and who's deserving of such a death. All right? So Jesus' response is just the ultimate example of how he threads a needle. Because what Jesus said in response to these people's questions and the cries of their hearts is not only are those people who died not worse than us, they're not worse sinners than you and me, he also doesn't say they're good people. Did you notice? He doesn't, he doesn't give in to this notion that they're worse because they died at some horrible death, but he also doesn't sort of let them off the hook as though they were good people. What we have to grow to understand in our walk with Jesus is that questions like, why do bad things happen to good people are not Christian questions. This question is so common in our vernacular that it's almost a given that it's okay or meaningful for a Christian to ask a question like this. The more biblical your worldview becomes, the less sensical a question like this will be. First of all, there's the problem of bad things. It's not that bad things don't, there is such a thing as bad things happening, but we really mean by bad things, what we really mean is unfair things, right? Bad things to us is just things that shouldn't happen because they're not fair. And the problem with words like fair and unfair is that they're, they're, they're shaded with our own limited human perspective. What do we know about fair? What do we know about unfair? How many times have we accused God or thought about God doing something unfair, not being fair with us? We know nothing about fair and unfair because our perspective is so limited, you guys. It reminds me of a story that a professor told one time about, uh, I heard him in a, preaching a sermon and he talked about being a professor and, and, and he talked about the beginning of a term. Every year, the freshman class would come into his, to his classroom and every year it was the same. He would pass out the syllabus and every semester was the same. There was a paper due at the end of every month of the semester. No questions asked unless you're like in the hospital unconscious that paper's due and if it's not turned in on time, it's an F. And he wrote it in the syllabus and the students went over the syllabus with the teacher and they all agreed on the first day of the semester, everybody thinks turning those papers in on time is gonna be no problem. So they all agree to the terms and conditions. And then he said he was everyone's favorite teacher for the next 30 days until the end of September when the first paper came due. 
Without fail, that freshman class would come in stumbling and bumbling and crying, and we just didn't have time. We haven't adjusted to the college life yet. We're still getting used to this. Please, teacher, professor, doctor, have mercy on us. We just need more time. And he got used to showing them mercy every year. The freshman classes were all the same. And he would give them more time, even though the syllabus everyone agreed to called for an F to be levied. Okay, okay, I get it. You said you're sorry. Just get it to me when you can. You've got two more weeks. And they would sing his praises. Literally, he said they they had a song that they would sing in the classroom, singing about how great a professor he really was. And he loved to hear their songs. But they only sang those songs for a little while. In fact, only about another 30 days until the end of October came around. And what the professor had to understand, according to these students, is that October is homecoming month, and we had floats to build and dances and parties to go to, and this is our first year in college, and we have to do homecoming right. We just ran out of time to do your paper. Please, we're sorry. Give us more time. And he talked about giving them more time to complete the paper the second time because they were contrite, because they pleaded and begged. He said, give me the paper within a week, and we're good. He was their favorite professor for another 30 days until the end of November when the third paper was due. And about the same number of students would show up with no papers in hand, and this time they didn't even bother to give an excuse. They weren't crying anymore. They weren't saying that they were sorry. They weren't talking about what a great professor this was. They just said, hey, we'll get it to you when we can. And the professor said, I remember getting my black book out, my notorious black book out, and marking by each person's name without a paper, F, F, F. And he said the outcry in that classroom every semester at the end of November is like there was a mass casualty event in the classroom. How could you? Where are you, God? Like This is unfair. How could this professor be so hateful? This isn't fair. And the professor talked about addressing one young man by the name, last name Johnson. Mr. Johnson, are you sure you want what's fair? because I could just as easily go back to October and September and give you what you deserved. But I have been merciful, and you have forsaken my mercy. And how often do we do the same? Forsaking the many, many, many mercies of God for so long until we become so entitled that to us what is just seems unfair. That's what's at at play today. This question, why do bad things happen to good people, is a false question. Bad things in terms of unfair things, unjust things do not happen. God has never dealt with you unjustly, and he never will. This is part and parcel to his nature as a good God. But that's not the only thing that's wrong with the question, why do bad things happen to good people? What's even more insidious about that question is the good people part. (laughs) Because according to Scripture, there's no such thing. Now, the world is sort of a self-esteem-driven world now, and and we have this culture where it's like, you know, you're good the way you are, and all that, it's okay, whatever. We're here to understand the Bible and to develop a Christian worldview. And if you develop a Christian worldview, you cannot, you cannot find room for the belief that some people are good and others are not. Every one of us is bad, according to God. And from heaven's perspective, because to be good implies that there is a standard of good. So then to be good would be to be like God, which means to be without sin. And who can stand? None of us. This is a a truth that is consistent throughout Scripture from the Old Testament. For example, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. That's the Old Testament, and that's just one of many passages I could pick to illustrate this point, that there's no good people. Also, in the New Testament, this theme is carried over in the writings of Paul, for example, where he wrote, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is perfect. No one but Jesus 
is good. So this is why the phrase, the question, why, why do bad things happen to good people, is doubly problematic, okay? This is the, the needle that Jesus is threading because he refuses to say on the one hand that these people who died in these tragic events were worse sinners than the rest of us, but he also refuses to say they were good people. So there's some other way of looking at this. And he's sort of warning us against the typical responses that we have to tragedies. And he's naming the, the most common one among the people of his day, which was the friends of Job. Right? Job suffered, and so his friends all thought he did something to make God mad, and so there's a reason. It's a karmic kind of thinking that can be easy to fall for. We can easily, even as Christians, I've heard Christian preachers and Christian leaders fall for this same way of thinking. There's floods in New Orleans. Well, it's because it's New Orleans, and God's had enough. You know? Or there's, there's earthquakes, tragic Deadly earthquakes in other parts of the world. Well, there's a majority Muslim nation. No, no, that's not Christian thinking. Okay? And, and, and there's not floods in California because whatever you hate about California is true. It's like, <laughs> I get it. I get it. If I was a cartoonist and I had to draw Satan, he would look a lot like California's governor probably. But I, I doesn't mean he's the reason. Okay? The reason we have to be careful about drawing these lines is because we're next. If it's really the case that bad things only happen to bad people, just wait. And really what that should, what that should evoke or elicit within us is a deeper question of if this is the case, when bad things happen and tragedies strike, Mass casualty events, our question shouldn't be just, why them, Lord? Our question really should be, why not me? Why not me? Not only should we be prompted to ask, why are they no longer here? The deeper discipleship question is, why am I still here? But for the mercy, but for the mercy but for the mercy of God, I'm still here, alive, not struck down, not dealt with justly by a good God who could strike me down fairly and justly, and yet I'm still here. So if bad things don't happen to good people and if unfair things, you know, quote unquote, aren't to blame for tragedies in the world, then what should our response be to these kinds of events? Jesus is pretty clear here. He says, I don't know if it's like a concession, like, like he knows how limited our perspective is, but he's like, you guys, when you can't make sense of what's going on in the world around you, when government officials do what government officials do and oppress the people they're supposed to you know, take care of or, or lead, let's say, and when towers fall, and when the earth shakes, and when the waters rise, when awful people do awful things to other awful people, maybe, maybe it's not just bad things happening to good people. Maybe you should take it as a warning sign. That's what he says. He says, unless you repent, right? Right? It's like, it's a totally different way of thinking. When tragedy strikes, he says, one thought you should think is unless I repent, I'm going to die too. Unless I repent. This is a red, a red flag for us. It should be. So repentance is the call of Jesus here. This is the part I didn't want to say because I don't like being that guy. I don't like being that preacher. I like being the love preacher. I like being the skeptics and, you know, stuff like that. And, and yet, there's a lot less of that stuff in Jesus' teachings than there is the call to simply repent. The first word of Jesus' first sermon ever preached was, guess what? Repent. To repent is to turn it is to willfully change your perspective or the direction that you're facing. To repent is to recognize that there's some part of you that does not fit with God, that is not belonging to God, that is not his yet. 
It's to acknowledge that you are a wretched man, right? Or a woman, like until you get to that point, to the end of yourself, there can be no repentance. And according to Jesus, without repentance, there can be no salvation. That's what's on the line. And I know it sounds borderline, works righteousness. Like I thought that, I thought that salvation was a gift of God's grace, Pastor Eric. You're always talking about how salvation's a gift. We don't have to do anything. It's just ours. It is. But you can also leave the gift unopened, unreceived unappreciated, unattained. That's what the unrepentant life is. You don't have to repent in order to be forgiven. Jesus already paid it all, but you do have to repent in order to receive his forgiveness and experience it and know in it and, and know it and live in it. That's why forgiveness and repentance matters so much. Repentance is opening the gift of God's forgiveness. And the more repentance there is in your life, the more of his gift you experience, all right? So in the the latter part of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul talks about the difference between a Christian or biblical perspective about the, the, the tragic events that happen in the world and a Christian one, uh, a biblical one and a, and a secular one. And I just want to read it uh, for you. I read one verse of this at Ash Wednesday service, um, but I'm going to read the whole thing now. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. Look what Paul says about repentance here. He says, even if I cause you sorrow by my letter, I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, so he had written them a scathing letter and hurt their feelings. You ever do that? You ever hit send on that email? That's what he did. And he's like, I don't regret it, but I did regret it, but I don't regret it. It's like Paul being a, a guy here, right? It's like, but I only regret it for a little while. But now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. I'm glad that my scathing letter brought you to repentance, in other words. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so you were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings, here it is, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what godly sorrow has produced in you, earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. Godly sorrow produces repentance, which leads us to pursue the holiness of God. If you want to be changed and you want to change the world around you, it doesn't begin with you just being a better person. It begins with you on your knees saying, I repent. And me too, by the way. I repent. I repent of the lies I've told. I repent of the lies I sing during a service. When we sing a song like, I surrender all and I don't mean it. I surrender a part of me, but not all of me. I'll give you a certain percentage of me. I surrender one-tenth of one percent or whatever would be a more real, would be a more honest song to sing. I surrender all. How dare we say such a thing? You know, You should keep singing. I'm not telling you not to sing, but sing aspirationally. Sing with a penitent heart. Lord, I surrender all, even though I know that I haven't. Lord, I surrender all, but forgive me. I repent. I repent of the small or big parts of me that I've held back from you. I've been playing games with you. I've been seeking religion instead of relationship with you. I've wanted you to meet my needs, but I haven't sought to serve you. All the things we do and leave undone, we just sort of let it float and weigh us down instead of saying simply, I repent. I'm yours. I'm sorry. I want more of you. That's the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is just feelings. I feel really bad about what I did but I'm going to keep doing it forever, probably. Like, godly sorrow is what brings repentance, and repentance is what brings the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts is very clear. Peter says, repent and be baptized, and then receive the Holy Spirit. Have you repented? Are you to the end of yourself? Is there some part of you that you're just sick of? Maybe a part of you that no one else knows about because you're ashamed and it's a secret, but you know it and you can't escape it or you don't think you can. Maybe it's because you've been too self-reliant and self-deceived and you've avoided the simple act of repentance. 
like a child in his father's presence or her father's presence. Lord, I'm sorry. I'll do better. Show me the way. I once heard a preacher say, worldly sorrow wants to tame the lion, but godly sorrow wants to kill it. To repent is to kill the lion. Jesus finished his teaching with this parable from Luke 13, back to our original passage, four verses, and then we're pretty much done. He says in Luke chapter 13, verse 6, he told this parable, a man uh, had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on the fig tree, but it didn't, he didn't find any. And so he went to the man who took care of the vineyard. So the landowner, God the Father, uh, almost always in Jesus' parables, the big wig is the father. Um, and then the caretaker is most likely the son in this analogy. And then uh, the landowner said to the caretaker, for three years, I, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied. So this is the caretaker talking to the landowner. Leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. What's Jesus saying? Time is running out. And y'all, I don't think in eight years of preaching at the story, I've ever said those words. Shame on me, honestly, because Jesus said them often. Time is short. Time is short. And unless you repent, a fate similar to that suffered under Herod's, I mean, uh, um, Pilate's henchmen, suffered under the Siloam Tower awaits us all, but not just a physical death that awaited them, an even more terrifying fate, a spiritual death, an eternal one. Time is short. Unless you repent, Jesus said. I know that those words sound deeply religious and offensive. They may even sound hateful. I would encourage you to hear them the same way Luke might have. Luke, the doctor, knew very well that being honest with your patient about what's wrong with them is the best way to show professionalism and love to your patients, to those you're caring for. When someone has cancer, you tell them they have cancer. You don't lie to them just because it's nicer. And in the same way, unless you repent, is the gentlest, most loving kind of warning because time is short. So make your heart his. Kill the lion. Say, I repent. Surround yourself with other contrite Christian hearts as we follow Jesus together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this reminder. It's a stark one, and it's challenging, to say the least. Um, I pray that uh, your spirit would move in this moment. Come on, Holy Spirit, just move, that you might wash away everything that needs to go, every lingering sin, every shadow of shame, until we are just like you, holy, Lord, and free from the chains that have bound us. We thank you, Jesus, for coming to save us, and we pray that we would have the courage to open the gift by repenting today. If there's anybody on the fence, if there's anyone in this room that's just thinking, this isn't for me, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would break them down in the gentlest way possible until there is surrender and real contrition, and a desire to live in harmony with you and with their fellow man. We thank you for this reminder and this warning that you've lifted up, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.